thank you everyone for showing up today. I would much rather be taking you out into a marsh and showing you all these wonderful things, but taking a virtual tour of a marsh today uh, will be uh, the second best thing. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I am currently a professor at Cape Cod Community College and the Massachusetts Maritime Academy. Uh, I'm a retired teacher and administrator from the Sandwich Public Schools. My background is environmental science and salt marshes are my favorite ecosystem. So this is something that I hope you'll enjoy today. Uh, if we think about the marshes in Barnstable, there are some wonderful systems that we have here. You're probably familiar with the great Barnstable Marsh and also, of course, the marsh system by Sandy Neck and many other places around town. Many of these marsh systems have their own unique characteristics, but there are some general properties that we find in all salt marshes. And I'm going to give you a tour of my favorite place, which is the Crockett Neck Salt Marsh here in Ketuit. Some of you may have been on a walk with me out there, but a lot of the things that we see there, we also see in several of these other places. So let's see if the technology is going to work here. I'm going to bring up my PowerPoint. Let's see, and hopefully you all can see that. So it says the ecology of Crockett Neck, but it really is taking a look at about all of these salt marshes here as well. So the very first uh, thing that we would see when we walk down to a marsh is this very tall grass. It isn't quite growing yet this time of the year, uh, but give it a few weeks and we start to see it. This is Spartina alterniflora or cord grass. Uh, several years ago, one of my students asked me, uh, Professor Newton, what's the most important plant on the earth? And of course, all plants are very important, uh, but I answered it anyway. And I, I picked this one. And I picked this one because here on Cape Cod, on the east coast of North America, this particular species is extremely important for many reasons. First of all, it is a major food source for a lot of different critters. Uh, many of them are microscopic, many of them live in the sediments. Some organisms may come in to graze on the leaves uh, from the uh, high tide, uh, but also when it dies and decomposes, it begins to form these large mats, which I'm sure you've seen, that wash offshore and then support a huge array of different things. And ultimately, all this energy gets passed all the way up the food web so that it actually supports all of our commercial shellfish and fin fish species, either directly or indirectly. In addition to that, it acts as a buffer uh, between the open ocean and our properties on land. One of the neat things about Croc and Neck is that we were able to preserve a large amount of the open space around there. And of course, that's the function of the Barnstable Land Trust to do that throughout the town. And that open space, in addition, also helps protect the marsh. So they work in a, a dual uh, function together, uh, basically to protect both the upland property and the aquatic property. Now, the thing about this is um, it can withstand saltwater inundation a couple of times a day when the high tide comes in, and it's certainly during big storms and also um, uh, during uh, times of uh, extreme high tide. And, you're probably have, asking yourself the question, how can the plants survive under those conditions? Most plants, when they're submerged in salt water, would lose fresh water to the environment and the cells would collapse or plasmalize. But Spartina's got some unique characteristics that allow it to survive and adapt to this particular area. One of which is that it actually gets rid of the salt through its leaves. It has these specialized cells which can secrete salt right through the leaves. And you can prove this to yourself this summer. If you just kind of rub your finger along a blade of grass, you can feel the salt crystals, you can even taste them. In addition to that, it's also got its root systems in a very, very anaerobic environment. That is, it's no oxygen down there. So it has another set of cells which can transport oxygen down to the roots and creates a little oxygenated atmosphere around the root systems themselves. And it is a very strongly attached to the sediment. So even if there are hit strong waves hitting it, uh, it's uh, still going to remain. So this is a really, really important plant. And it's the first thing you see along the edge at uh, any salt marsh. Now, you also might see some of these sections of marsh breaking away. We call these hummocks. This little structure you see right here is a hummock. And what happens is occasionally a piece of a salt marsh will break away and it'll either become high and dry and nothing will happen, or it will get uh, lodged in a creek somewhere 
begin to build up sediment and actually begin to form more marsh. There is a section over at Crockett Neck where I think it's actually growing. I think I will show you a slide of this in a minute, where it seems to be increasing, what we call emergent salt marsh, seems to be increasing and creating a little lagoon, which is a little unusual because most researchers today are concerned that with rising sea level due to climate change, that a lot of the marshes are becoming flooded or they've moved in inland if they can. Uh, but at Crockett Neck, it looks to me, without any accurate measurements, but it looks to me like there's some places that are building up. And this is how marshes form. They tend to trap this sediment in this mud. And if there are rib mussels living on these little islands and there are grasses that can survive, it creates a whole new part of the marsh. We also call this peat. So you see this huge section right in here, which is basically decomposed plant material over time. This is a major carbon sink uh, for the coastline. And what I mean by that is that we hear a lot about how plants can take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and absorb it and store it in their tissues. We now know that salt marshes, as well as uh, mangrove swamps in the south, are major sources of carbon sequestration, major sources where carbon can be stored. And that's just another good reason why we need to protect our coastal wetlands uh, is because they are doing this very important function for us. So there's a lot of carbon that's just built up over the years, stored in those uh, neat sediments. They're also great habitats for some of the animals that we'll look at in a few minutes. There's a little black crab called the marsh crab appropriately. Uh, Sasama is the uh, genus. Uh, and uh, sometimes it nibbles on the cord grass and on the times it will feed on some of the small animals. But you also see a lot of rib mussels embedded in there. Uh, and uh, a few other critters too can survive in these sediments. So this is the area that I think the marsh is beginning to grow over here by this walkway. And you do see that in a lot of other places too, not just at Croconet uh, and not just at Barnstable, but there are some other places on the Cape, Grace Beach and Yarmouth comes to mind. And you can see that at low tide, it's really a mudflat area uh, that a lot of these grasses here, uh, this is Spartan, this is obviously taken in the fall, um, and uh, they just kind of hold this whole sediment in place here. So this is a really, really important habitat for a lot of shellfish too. So in the fall, it begins to turn brown and it uh, begins to fall, fall aside and begins to decay and fall apart. And so it looks like it's all matted at this time of the year. In just a few weeks though, you're gonna to start to see some new growth coming up and the marsh will be once again restored. Another winter characteristic is uh, you see a lot of these shrubs all along the banks of the marsh. And what's interesting about a salt marsh is there are certain kinds of plant species that we find almost exclusive to a marsh uh, and they form a zonation. And what I mean by that is they're very distinct bands of certain kinds of plants all along the marsh, depending upon their location, elevation, and their exposure to salt water. This is a shrub called marsh elder, which forms a ring all the way around most salt marshes. I'm sure you've seen it in the summer. And it's just a little bit higher elevation than the Spartina altiniflora or the cord grass. Uh, down here is the cord grass, all matted now. And you can see this ring of marsh elder that completely circles the marsh. Uh, and this is usually the furthermost point that you might find insects from the mainland area. I found praying mantises, for example, in the marsh elder, but you don't see any out in the salt water area. So it's also an area where you see a little tiny snail uh, called the coffee bean snail or the marsh snail. Scientific name is Melampus. And it's really interesting because at low tide, in the summer, you'll see a lot of these snails at the tops of the grasses because they have a little primitive lung so they would drown uh, if they did not get out of the water. Uh, and uh, so that's an interesting animal that you would see right in that particular area. Now, one of the things about Croconeck, I mentioned the open space that surrounds Croconeck, uh, and there's a wonderful set of trails there that uh, if you haven't walked, you really should take uh, some time and walk on. Uh, they're really beautiful. And you'll see a lot of the traditional kinds of trees that we have in this area. This, of course, is the common pitch pine. It's a pitch pine. These are the female cones, uh, probably in their first year of development. Pitch pine has these little prickly cones, which is the female, like I said. 
and they have three needles per clump or fascicle. You can always tell a pitch pine with three needles. Uh, and um, pitch pine can grow in acidic soil and sandy soil, you know, it grows all over the Cape. Uh, and you see it, of course, all the way down close to the water at Croconet. The male cones, on the other hand, I don't have a picture of them, but you, I'm sure you know about them. Uh, if you've ever seen all that yellow pollen uh, that we'll probably be experiencing in about another month or so uh, on puddles and so forth, a lot of people are allergic to it. Uh, that yellow pollen uh, comes from the tiny brown male cones of the pitch pine. Uh, and if you were to look at one of those, um, one of those uh, pollen grains under a microscope, you'd see it has like these little flaps uh, which I call Mickey Mouse ears, and that enables them to spread via the wind over long distances uh, so that they can fertilize the female. Another pine tree that's very common uh, in the Croconeck area and along other marshes as well is the, is the white pine. And the white pine differs from the pitch pine in two major ways. One, the needles are five in each clump or fascicle, and the cones are much longer, uh, longitudinal. They don't have the real sharp prickly uh, edges to them that the pitch pine has. They also have kind of a softer look to them and kind of a bluish green tinge uh, to the needles. Um, so this is also a native species and it was widely used as a source of lumber uh, and uh, for shipbuilding on the Cape for many years uh, and uh, pretty much disappeared in a lot of parts of the Cape, but now we see quite a bit of it in some of these other areas where it has been reestablished. One of the things about a salt marsh, as you begin to approach it, you start to see what we call coastal banks. Coastal banks are really interesting to me because they carry with it their own set of vegetation and animal life that is kind of like in between a terrestrial environment and exposure to the ocean. Uh, and you see a lot of these little tiny ground cover plants. This one is called bearberry, one of my favorites. You can actually grow this on your property. Uh, puts out these little berries, which are good wildlife fruit, real tiny, evergreen, and can grow all along the edges. Uh, and it tends to establish a foothold to help protect those areas from erosion. Uh, so this is a coastal plant. Uh, the highest population I've seen of this, or the largest population I've seen of this, is down at the National Seashore in the Marconi area, where the dunes are just absolutely covered with this. But you do see it over at Croconeck and Sandy Neck and a few other places as well as an effective uh, dune erosion plant, erosion control plant. You also see a lot of mosses. Uh, this is the cushion moss. Uh, and um, mosses are interesting in that they will change the soil uh, when they die and decompose, making it uh, more nu nutritious for other plants to come in and colonize. So it's like an early stage of succession, uh, which is really interesting in some of these marsh systems, particularly again, as you walk from the woodland area down to the wetland, you start to see these transitional communities beginning to take place. One very common group of living things, uh, and I bring this up because this is all good news for Cape Cod, uh, are the lichens. Now, a lichen is an interesting organism. A uh, lichen is actually two organisms in one. They form a symbiotic relationship to the fact that they actually are a new species. So if you were to take a little bit of this lichen and chop it all up with a scalpel or razor blade and look at it under a microscope, you would see a lot of single cell green algae that are circled and covered with a filamentous brown fungus. And it's the fungus that basically creates this relationship. So these organisms are actually classified in the fungi kingdom and not the plant kingdom. Uh, and scientists now believe that there's probably a parasitic relationship, which means that some of the algae cells actually get killed when the uh, symbiosis forms and forms the lichen. This is a common one called reindeer lichen. Sometimes it's called reindeer moss, but it's not a moss, it's a lichen. Uh, it's very common around salt marsh systems, including croconeck. Uh, you find it on the ground primarily. It gets real brittle when it, um, it's a dry time of the year or we haven't had much rain like we're seeing right now. And, but it also absorbs moisture from the air and, of course, from rainfall and gets nice and soft at that time. The presence of lichens on trees and on the ground uh, throughout this area is actually a good sign for air quality. 
because lichens are highly vulnerable to sulfur dioxides, which is one of the substances uh, from automobile exhaust. So in large metropolitan urban areas, you often see very few, if any, lichens at all, like in Boston. But here on the Cape, there are a lot of them. By the way, you often see them hanging from trees and so forth. They don't harm the tree. Uh, they are actually quite common, quite, uh, quite uh, normal to see them on the barks of trees. Okay, you got you to gotta know about this one. Everybody has seen poison ivy, uh, toxic catendron. And uh, I bring it up because it is a very common plant around marshes. It's kind of interesting in several ways. One, poison ivy is a very, very efficient erosion control plant. Uh, so you see it growing on dune systems and you see it growing along the edges of marshes. At Croconeck, there's an island right out in the middle of Quinquisset Cove that is absolutely covered with this. So I called it Poison Ivy Island. Uh, and uh, it's, it's subject to salt spray and heavy wave action and storms all year, and yet it just flourishes there. It can grow as a shrub, it can grow as a woody vine, it can grow as a little tiny herb. And of course, we have to avoid it because uh, if we come in contact with any part of the plant that's been broken, the sap has a substance called urushiol, which can cause the dermatitis. And you can get this any time of the year, and not just in the summer. It has these three shiny leaflets. And if you can see in the lower left-hand corner here, here are the berries, uh, which actually are a major food source for a lot of local bird species uh, where the substance doesn't affect them at all. Uh, the berries turn kind of gray uh, in the winter time, but they are a food source for wildlife. Uh, years ago, when I was on the Sandy Net Governing Board and we were debating how do we keep people off the dune system, we said sort of tongue in cheek, well, we could plant poison ivy uh, and that would keep people off. Uh, but um, of course, we, were, you know, we were, didn't actually do that, uh, but uh, we didn't have to because it grows on dunes anyway. And of course, now there are a lot of ticks on dunes. So um, this is still a very effective erosion control plant. So I got to talk about, I've never given a talk without going over my favorite group of all, which are the seaweeds. And I got to talk a little bit about them here, uh, because when you go down to the marsh, you often find, especially if there's like a little beach in the bay and so forth, uh, like you see a croconet, you find some different seaweeds. So this is one that we don't like to find. Uh, this is called codium. Some people refer to it as a dead man's fingers. It's also got the common name of oyster thief. Codium was an introduced green alga species into our waters around the late 1950s and early 1960s. Uh, and for a long period of time, it was just out there. It wasn't really a, a, a nuisance, but in the last five to 10 years, uh, the amount of codium has increased dramatically in our waters. And it's a real big problem because you can actually see here, it can grow right over the filter feeding siphons of shellfish and prevent them from feeding. It gets its name oyster thief uh, for that reason, and it also can remove shellfish right out of the substrate. Uh, it can attach itself to scallops. You know, they have that little movement, that little jet propulsion, if you will, in the water column. It can weigh them down. It's very heavy, it's very buoyant. And one of the reasons it's so successful is that it can reproduce several different ways, which is often a general characteristic of any kind of invasive species. So if you were to take some of this codium and rip it apart and throw it back in the water, you now get two different algae uh, specimens because it can reproduce by fragmentation. And it does that because there's absolutely no cross walls between the cells. So the internal cytoplasm just flows throughout the whole alga. Uh, and therefore, it's basically one giant cell. It also, on the tips of the branches, has structures called utricles, which are also reproductive uh, structures, and it can reproduce sexually, so it can release gametes into the water column, and it even can reproduce by an interesting process called parthenogenesis, where the female gamete can grow into a whole new seaweed um, without fertilization from the male. So all of this gives it a kind of a competitive edge over native species that might be in our waters. There are a lot of theories as to why it's increasing. It, our waters have a lot more nitrogen in them, and there are a lot of algae species that love nitrogen. They actually, I'm going to show you one at the end here that is nitrogen loving that's created a problem around many of our marsh systems. Um, so what do we do about this? People always ask me, 
Uh, this makes a wonderful addition to your gardens, uh, to composting. I recommend you collect it at the upper portion of the beach where it's sort of dried up a little bit. Uh, it can be really, really a big problem. I was collecting some at Douse's Beach in Osterville, in, collecting seaweeds at Douse's Beach in Osterville in January one year, and this was so thick it was interfering with the waves. Uh, and I also saw, I was doing a marine program over in Yarmouth uh, two summers ago, same situation in August. There was so much of this, one of the hotels had to come in and kind of cart it all the way off the beach for their guests. So codium is out there and you do see it at not just in marsh systems or along the edges there, but in beaches as well. All right, that was one of the bad guys. This is one of the good guys. <laughs> this is called Fucus vesiculosis, or we like to call it rockweed. Rockweed is a real common seaweed and in a very important part of a salt marsh ecosystem. At low tide, if you walk along the banks, remember that picture, that second picture I showed you with the banks? Sometimes you just see just enormous amount of this hanging over the edge of the banks uh, at low tide. And it has kind of a mucilage layer, so it retains moisture, helping to protect anything that's underneath it, which is usually a healthy population of rib mussels, bryozoans, hydroids, uh, small little crabs. Uh, and they're finding protection from predators as well as from the warm sun uh, during low tide by hiding under the fronds of this particular seaweed. This one's known for its little paired air bladders that you see along the edges here. They have a gas inside them, which helps it float to the surface. So it can maximize photosynthesis. Because even though this particular um, seaweed is brown, belongs to the brown algae, it still has chlorophyll and can make its own food. It also is good for erosion control on the banks. Not only is the spartina got those nice heavy roots and rhizome uh, embedded in the sediments, but now you get a layer of this rockweed also embedded in there, uh, which is uh, keeping the sediments in place. Uh, so like I say, this is one of the good guys. It reproduces because at the tips here, you might even be able to see these little bumps all along here. These little bumps represent structures called conceptacles, uh, and uh, they could be female or male, and they release their gametes into the water. They're attracted to each other chemically, and then they settle back down again. It gets its name because you often find it growing on hard surfaces like jetties and groins. If you've walked along the Cape Cod Canal, you've seen its cousin, the knotted rack, another form of rockweed, which is very common there. But this is uh, one you'd see in salt marshes. Um, one of the interesting areas of research going on right now around salt marshes is looking at the growth of the eastern red cedar. Now, this is a plant that grows everywhere. We've all seen it. It's very common. It's actually one of my favorites. It's also called juniper. Those little blue berries, by the way, that you see are not true berries. Those are actually cones because this is a conifer. The reason I bring this up is because you sometimes see rows of these um, on the outside edges of marsh. I think of the marsh system over at South Cape Beach in Mashpee. Um, but you often see rows of them where bird droppings have left the seeds. Uh, but one of the things we're noticing is that some of the needles or the leaves are beginning to yellow along the coast. And that's just uh, another piece of physical evidence that sea level may be rising. There might be more increased storm activity. So this plant has to either move, migrate, if you will, uh, further inland, or it's going to be uh, wiped out. And there's an interesting research going on at Wakoit Bay on this very phenomenon. Another organism that we don't like to see, <laughs> I'm sure you have, is of course the tall reed or Phragmites. Now, some marsh systems uh, have quite a bit of this around the edges. I think of the Scorton Creek area in Sandwich, uh, certainly the Barnstable Marsh over by the railroad tracks of uh, 6A, you've seen a lot of this as well. Phragmites um, can grow right up to the edges of salt marshes because it can withstand salinities as high as 15 parts per thousand, which is about half that of seawater. Uh, but it can't stand complete seawater. And so one of the ways of controlling Phragmites is to increase tidal flow in marsh systems. And there've been a lot of projects on Cape Cod that have successfully done this from province down to the canal. Uh, and um, what's interesting about this, at least at Crock and Neck on the bay side, you don't see any of this. It's just too salty. 
But there's a freshwater wetland over um, at the edge of uh, Quinquisic Cove where you see a healthy population of this. So it'll come right up to the edge of a marsh. Uh, cutting them, mowing them, does no good. What it does is it sends a hormonal signal to the rhizome to grow more. Uh, basically says, hey, we're under attack, let's uh, grow more branches. So it's just a temporary solution. Some people like it, they think it's a pretty plant. Um, I'm always asked, well, is there some value to it? And I have seen red winged blackbirds uh, hide in the, uh, maybe even nesting in the Phragmites. But I had some students a couple of years ago do some studies over in Sandwich and they found over a hundred plants per square meter. Uh, and it just crushes anything in its way. In its way. Uh, we also looked at some over at the Cape Cod National Seashore where they've been having some issues as well. Uh, some of the really cool plants in a marsh, this is uh, Salicornia, um, sea pickle. Uh, and uh, for those of you who are into history, you probably know that this was a plant that was used for relish and as in a salads and so forth. To me, it's very salty. It is edible, but it's very, very salty. It turns a beautiful bright red color in the fall and then brown in the winter. Uh, from an ecologist's point of view, though, it is interesting because some of these areas, these exposed mudflat areas, this was one of the first plants to colonize them to prepare it for the um, cordgrass that will come in a little bit later. We all love this one. This is sea lavender. The, the picture's a little blurry, so I apologize for that. Um, but sea lavender is a beautiful plant that you find in the summer, growing in the marsh, a little tiny purple plant. There was a lot of concern by conservation commissions many years ago that people were picking this uh, for dry flower arrangements. Please don't, because when you do, you remove the plant's ability to set seed. And it was actually disappearing in many parts of the Cape. But the education campaign that uh, was undertaken by many of the local boards seems to be working, because they now see quite a healthy population in many parts of the Cape, including Crockenack, Douses Beach and austerville has got a nice population of it on the marsh side. Uh, and uh, I've seen huge population of it at the National Seashore. Um, I remember, though, taking a walk out of the West Barnstable Marsh once, and there must have been, I don't know, 2,000 people out there picking it all uh, one year, and I actually spoke to a couple of them. They weren't too happy with me, but um, and nevertheless, I just felt that the need to, you know, hey, don't take it all, uh, because there won't be any next year. Let's talk about some of the animals in the marsh. Uh, probably the one that you would see the most of is the rib mussel. Now, rib mussels are kind of interesting. They also form a zonation, if you will, all along the edges of the banks, and it can be kind of a vertical zonation. You can see a healthy population all the way down to the substrate. Um, and that makes it impossible for other living things to come in there and colonize, because this is a very aggressive animal in that sense. So when you get a huge mussel population, that can attract starfish or sea stars in the lower part of the water. Sea stars really don't like to be out of the water. Uh, that's, it's just not something that they can survive in, unlike the mussel. So what happens is you get a small population of sea stars come in and they can pick off the lower rung of mussels. And the sea stars are much stronger animal than the mussel. It gets into kind of a tug of war with the animal. The mussel is trying to keep its clam shell closed and the sea, the sea star wraps its arms around it and tries to pry it open. And all it has to do is get it open a little bit and then the sea star averts its stomach outside of itself into the muscle to digest it. Very remarkable. You can actually see this uh, time lapse on YouTube if you, uh, if you check it out. Uh, so the good news about that ecologically is that the sea star is a predator. And what it does is it picks off that lower rung of muscles. And now you've got a habitat or a place for other living things to come in and colonize. So the presence of predators, sometimes we don't like them, but they actually can be beneficial to the environment. So remember that next time someone criticizes great white sharks, uh, because they also play a critical role in the environment. Don't worry, you're not going to see any over the crock and neck. Uh, but um, you will see some other things there, as we'll see in a minute. Um, this one is an interesting one you find in marshes. It's called the stout tagalus, and a lot of people say it looks like a razor clam. Uh, but it's not a razor clam, it's somewhat related to it. And you find this embedded in the marsh right out into the grasses themselves. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's really a unique one that we find in a marsh system. 
This is, by the way, I show another picture of the rib muscle here. This is how they embed themselves. And they sometimes form large clumps together. If you've ever tried to pull them apart, it's really hard to do so. And that's because they are attached by these strong structures called bissel threads, which is a very powerful protein in nature. Uh, and um, they are really, really attached in there uh, so that um, they can then filter feed when the, uh, when the um, tide comes in. One of the commercial animals that are often seen in marshes is, of course, the quahog. Uh, quahog, uh, I don't have one to show the other side, it's got that purple coloration on the inside. Uh, if you were to count these really heavy rings, not every, every single ring, but the really thick, heavy one, rings, that actually is one year growth. Uh, quahogs can live up to 20 to 25 years, uh, so sometimes you'll see one that's been pretty old. Uh, one of my favorite foods is a, is a stuffed quahog, so uh, we know that this is a commercially important species as well. Uh, and they are embedded, of course, in the sediments. Next to it, by the way, is one of the most common animals around, which is the slipper snail. And we don't see a lot of it in mudflat areas, but if it's kind of like a sandy beach area associated with it, like you'd see at Douses, which also has an extensive marsh system, you just see gazillions of these shells washed up on the beach. I think I have a picture of that a little later. Uh, periwinkle snails are also interesting. Periwinkle snails are an introduced species. Uh, many people don't realize that because they're just everywhere. We see them all over the place, but they haven't always been here. Um, periwinkle snails have kind of like a, a built-in antifreeze that allows them to survive in the winter. Uh, whenever I was teaching environmental science during the winter months and my students wanted to study animals, well, there aren't a lot around, I always let them study periwinkle snails because they can do some interesting things. Um, what we did with periwinkle snails is we actually wanted to know a couple of things. We wanted to know how far do they travel? Do they actually stay in place or do they move around? And can we estimate their population size in a small area? So we went out, we collected a bunch of them, and we marked them with red nail polish and put them back into the environment exactly where we found them. And then we kept monitoring them over a couple of weeks period. And it was very interesting. We determined, we probably shouldn't have been surprised by this, but we determined that they, they move around based on temperature. So if they have some really cold days, they do what other living things do. They huddle together. Uh, and you see clumps and clumps of them basically hiding away from the strong wind or the cold. Uh, and on warmer days, they become very antisocial. They're all off in different directions. Uh, they even leave little trails for you to follow. They also seem to have a preference for certain kinds of rock surfaces, but we weren't able to uh, completely figure that one out. Uh, so they're very interesting. Now we thought up to ourselves, okay, when we put that little red dot on them, are we affecting their behavior? I, I can't answer that. Does that mean that they'll be more visible to a predator? Or does it mean that the predator would see it and not recognize it and say, I don't want to eat that, it's got a big red dot on it. Uh, or would it be more visible to little children coming along and picking them up and moving them somewhere? <laughs> so there were some things that we couldn't control, but we did get some interesting data out of that. Okay, those are the slipper snails next to a very large scallop shell. Um, another thing that you see around marshes and bays and estuaries out in a little bit deeper water are very extensive eelgrass beds. And eelgrass beds are very important because they support scallop populations, lobsters, blue crabs, flounder. Uh, and um, Croconet does have some out there, but they've been disappearing over the years. This just shows you the uh, frequency of slipper snail shells. If you go over to Dowsage, you certainly will see that. Another interesting animal, if you have any kind of a groin or, or jetty or rock wall or piling or anything like we see in all these places, um, you start to see barnacles uh, attaching themselves uh, and living there. And there's also a number of periwinkle snails in here. Barnacle is the only crustacean that spends its entire adulthood upside down on its head. The larval stages attach to the rocks and it creates this calcareous um, shell with a number of different plates. The opening is referred to as an operculum. And what they do is they use their little feathery feet to capture small food particles as the water brings them by. Uh, so I call it the sedentary crustacean. I just had uh, my college students go out and measure some of these and measure the perculums and so forth, uh, which was uh, kind of interesting. All right, can you believe this? This is a picture I took last 
September at Crocodet. This is a Portuguese man of war. Now, I have never seen one of these at Crocodet. I grew up in Catillet. I have never seen one around here. Uh, but I started hearing reports about them uh, that I heard that the hospitals had several people that had been uh, stung by them. Uh, and in the last couple of years, our waters have been very warm uh, in the 80s and some days. Uh, it's beginning to have an impact on lobsters and other critters. But one day I'm down there and I saw this right out the edge of the water. And I, first I thought it was a plastic bag. And then as I got closer, I could see that it was a the sail of a man of war. Most of the tentacles have been uh, eaten away, probably by a turtle, uh, which don't get affected by it. Um, so the Portuguese man of war is not a true jellyfish. It's actually a colonial animal. And the tentacles have a series of what we call polyps that all have a specialized function for defense, for feeding, for reproduction. And collectively, they make up an individual organism. And this large thing you see here is the sail, which helps it adjust in the water, quality, water column. Uh, so, um, you know, as a student in Florida, I used to see them down in the Keys, uh, but uh, it's rare up here, although it's getting more common. Why? Well, probably because our water is warmer, probably because the Gulf Stream, they get caught up in that and they're coming up here and there are more of them. If you do see one, don't touch it, even if it's stranded, because the tentacles have these very powerful stinging cells called nematocysts and they can really hurt. Uh, you can even go into a coma, respiratory arrest uh, for some people. So you have to be very careful to, to avoid them. But you can imagine in the Gulf of Mexico where they're common that uh, swimmers, marathon swimmers in particular, worry about these animals more than they do sharks. So that was Croconac Marsh. Look at that, you never know what you're gonna find. And here's another unusual animal that I found there. Um, I actually seen quite a few of these this is called a sea cucumber. And a sea cucumber is an echinoderm, which means it's related to sea stars, sea urchins, sand olives. What's interesting about this, I found in this embedded in this algae bloom that was going on there. Uh, and um, this animal is a, a bottom feeder. Uh, and it has an interesting characteristic that if it gets disturbed, it can actually release portions of its organ systems, like its digestive system and respiratory system. And then it basically regenerates new ones. Uh, and uh, they often exist in large numbers in the substrate, in a muddy substrate, like a quiet bay. So at low tide at Croconet, I have seen quite a few of these washed up. In fact, I've seen them more there in that marsh system than anywhere else. One day we saw about 50 of them washed up and we just you know, saved them by putting them back in the water again. Uh, but that's called a sea cucumber. It's an animal, not a plant. One of the most beautiful birds, of course, is the great blue heron um, with its large wingspan of several feet, the largest wingspan of any bird on the Cape. Uh, the great blue heron nests in the tops of trees. Uh, it often feeds in the marshes, particularly a low tide. Uh, this animal is um, overwintering on the Cape now, where it never used to, again, because our winters have been milder on the whole. Uh, with a couple of exceptions. Uh, there's at least a couple of nesting pairs at Croconet, but you'll see them around a lot of uh, marsh systems now, uh, and not just marsh systems, you see them in freshwater marsh areas too. Um, they make a real loud squawking sound when you disturb one, which I have always said must be what a pterodactyl sounded like, because uh, they can really, really frighten you if you don't see them first. Oh, my favorite animal in the marsh is the fiddler crab. Uh, and we did a walk uh, the other day, um, it was in March, and it was kind of chilly, but we'd actually collected a couple, uh, so they were just beginning to emerge. The fiddler crab is a very important animal of a salt marsh. Uh, it aerates the marsh when it digs its holes, it fertilizes it with its waste, and it's a huge food source for a lot of animals, other larger crabs, but also even terrestrial animals like raccoons will come down and feed on them at low tide. This one here is a male, and it can tell it's a male because of the very large claw here. This is a right clawed male, and the male uses the claw in courtship display as well as in defense. Uh, and if he loses that claw, he will actually regener regenerate another one on the other side, on the left-hand side. 
So I told, um, I was teaching a high school group at Wakoit Bay a couple of summers ago, and I told them that story because they were finding left clawed and right clawed fiddler crabs. And they said, okay, for the rest of the week, we're gonna keep records of all the numbers that we find. And uh, so they did. And I, I guess I got a couple of hundred of them in all. And do you wanna know it was 50-50? <laughs> now I'm not saying that's a scientific study, but that's what they determined. Uh, and uh, of course they had these antennae here, which are really, um, really uh, characteristic of them. There's about three different species of fiddler crab on the Cape. Uh, and they make these little holes in the substrate and you can see all the little balls of sand outside the holes. If you go down to the edge of a marsh in the summertime, I don't care where it is, as long as it's not heavily vegetated, it's kind of an open muddy area. Uh, they can live in the grasses too, but they like some open areas. If you go down to low tide in a hot humid day, you'll see hundreds of these animals scurrying about. about. Very, very cool animal. Also an edible species uh, in the marshes, usually in the uh, muddy areas are the blue crabs. This is Kalanekis, you can tell from the uh, blue color. Uh, and uh, this was also found at Crokinek. Uh, it's got these uh, sharp points on the tips here and nine of these along each margin. Uh, and the blue crab um, it can swim, it's a swimming crab and it also can move its claws around the back. So be careful if you ever handle one of these, it can really, really pinch badly. It can break skin if you're not careful. So you want to use a net if you're ever trying to collect blue crabs. And people do because they are edible uh, and quite delicious, actually. In fact, over at Douses Beach, I think on the uh, walkway there, there's actually a little sign with some information about the town regulations on blue crab collecting. They're back, and here they are, the ospreys. I saw them the other day. Uh, they come back usually at the end of March every year, and they'll be gone by the 1st of October. One, one of the most beautiful, majestic birds we have on the Cape. Uh, there's at least two in a, a nest over at Croconet, but I suspect there are more. Um, they like to um, nest uh, high above wetland systems. They're outstanding uh, fishermen. Uh, they can account for the diffraction of light in the water when they go diving, and then they bring up the fish, holding it parallel in their talons, so they take it back to the nest. Um, the osprey, I bring this up too because it is a success story in conservation. This animal is now very common, but when I grew up on the Cape, there weren't any. Back in the 1960s and 70s, most of the birds had disappeared, uh, and that was because they were adversely affected by the pesticide DDT. Uh, DDT was a miracle pesticide that was developed around World War II, and was used mainly to kill off mosquitoes that were carrying malaria. After the war, we started using it indiscriminately everywhere to uh, attack any kind of insect that we didn't like, including the gypsy moth, which is one of the reasons that uh, insect increased. Uh, but at any rate, it had a devastating impact on birds of prey, such as the osprey, the eagle, and many others, because it interfered with an enzyme which prevented them from laying their shells, or they laid shells too thin, and so there were no young. Once DDT was determined to be a potential carcinogen in humans uh, in the 1970s, early 70s, it was banned for the most part, still used in other parts of the world. Uh, but it was basically banned around here. Uh, and uh, it took about 15 years for it to break apart in the environment. And lo and behold, many of these species have come back from oblivion and now they're very, very common, which is really good news. Uh, so there's a lesson to be learned here that when we learned about a particular environmental stressor and we remove that from the environment, oftentimes the environment is flexible enough that it can come back and can be restored. And here's an example. The eagle has also now been taken off the endangered species list. And one of my students um, is the young man who discovered the first uh, eagle nest uh, in Mashpee, first nest on Cape Cod. Uh, so we now have them as well. I don't have any pictures of them, but uh, they're around. So we've had mild winters, but there was one winter we did not. And that was the winter of 2000, I think it was 15. It was a few years ago. Anybody that spent the winter here will remember this one. I grew up on the Cape, like I said, and this was the worst I'd ever seen. Uh, we had weeks and weeks of zero weather. There were icebergs on the beaches. We had one blizzard after another. Now I managed to make my way down Croconet one cold day, and this is Papanesset Bay, frozen, <laughs> frozen solid. 
uh, as you can see, not, not that it's safe to walk out there, but nevertheless, that was unusual to, to witness. Uh, and I haven't seen that ever, but there's a picture of it. I also mentioned earlier this. This is the decomposing Spartina, which forms these mats, uh, which are, of course, um, very, very important. I see this and I say, ah, there's food. That's food for a lot of living things, both inshore and offshore, particularly if it gets washed out to sea. And this detritus breaks apart by microscopic organisms, both in the substrate and out in the water. And it just is uh, a major part of the food web in a salt marsh ecosystem. This is another site from Croconeck that I did not want to see. I had been talking to some people from the Barnstable Water Coalition and a couple of other places that had been asking me about a new seaweed that they found that they've been seeing in abundance uh, in many uh, bays and estuaries. And uh, this is Croconeck. Uh, this is called Heterosiphonia japonica. I don't think it has a common name, but somebody did call it uh, witch's hair or something like that. Anyway, this is one that um, is becoming a real big nuisance uh, here in Barnstable uh, in uh, many of our bays. Uh, you can see it's clearly a, uh, a bloom, an algae bloom. This was taken, I believe, in late September. And the thing about this one is that when it dies and decomposes, it um, also it could be, be a nuisance. Some seaweeds will actually release hydrogen sulfide gas, which is toxic. Uh, I'm not sure this one does, but it's a real big problem and it's clogging um, fishermen's nets and it's, you know, it's really become a nuisance. Now it's growing very quickly because it was first discovered, I understand, in Rhode Island in 2009 and then now it has spread all the way up the main coast too. Uh, so this um, presumably came in on ballast and it now is moving and growing much faster than some of the other invasives. In fact, here's a little bit of codium you can see here uh, in amongst the heterosavonia. So I'm gonna be watching this carefully this summer uh, and uh, make sure that um, it isn't getting worse uh, because this, is, uh, this could, has potential being a big problem. So marshes have these wonderful areas. This is a beautiful shot at Croconeck. Uh, and uh, this is what we'll see this summer. This large, pool area and this smaller one over to the right. Uh, a lot of people call them tide pools, but technically they're referred to as pans, P-A-N-N-E-S. And they are connected via a creek. It's hard to see the creek, but it's right along here uh, to the Papanessa Bay here, to the bay. And these pans are places where a lot of living things come in to uh, lay their eggs, to escape predators. Sometimes they get trapped uh, in these little places. Um, and this whole area is kind of like what I call quaking earth, which means that it's not solid earth. It's basically absorbing like a shock absorber uh, the water coming from the ocean. So if this wasn't here, where we live up in these upland areas would be very, very vulnerable uh, to storm action and maybe even saltwater intrusion. Uh, that's why one of the reasons why salt marshes uh, protected under the Wetlands Protection Act here in Massachusetts. Uh, and I took some, some of the guests on my walk last week uh, to this little pan right here, which has always got water in it. We formed a little circle around it, and then I asked everybody to jump up and down. And as they did, the earth moved to prove that this stuff has really got all kinds of water in there, and it's just blocking it from getting into the upland area. That's my last slide. I want to show you a couple of things. I didn't have a picture of this animal, but I definitely want to show you it because I'm sure you've all seen it. This is, of course, a horseshoe crab. This is actually a molt of a horseshoe crab. I can tell because you can see here where the animal came out as it was getting larger. Uh, and um, I always get these phone calls in late summer that there's a horseshoe crab kill at Loop Beach or someplace. And of course, I know you go down there and you find a couple of dozen of these molts. Uh, as the animal gets larger, it has to grow a new shell, and it usually does that. It can do that a couple of times during the summer, particularly the young males, uh, but they'll do it mainly at the end of the summer, and then they go out into deeper water to hibernate. You really have to know something about this animal, though. This is a fascinating animal. It's not a true crab. It's more closely related to scorpions and spiders, and it's actually been on the earth for over 400 million years. 
Uh, and it raises the question, how could it survive that long? And the answer is probably in its blood. It basically doesn't get sick. It has a substance in its blood, which we actually have used to test medicine and surgical equipment for the presence of bacterial endotoxins. Uh, it's called LAL, uh, Limulus Amoebocyte Lysate. Uh, and I'm sure some of you know all about this. But, but from what I also understand, it was used to test the uh, safety and efficiency of the COVID vaccines that have been recently developed. Uh, the horseshoe crab has saved thousands of lives. Uh, they take a blood sample, don't kill the animal, they take a blood sample, and the blood is blue, by the way, because it has copper instead of iron in its hemoglobin. They take a small blood sample, uh, and, um, and, it, and it's very expensive, uh, but uh, very important. Uh, and then the animals are put in holding tanks, they're marked and re-released back into the environment again. Uh, and it has really, really been a lifesaver. So not only does this animal deserve protection because it's been around so long, it was here before the dinosaurs, but because it has such significant medical importance to our species as well. Uh, and uh, there's been research on its eyes. It has nine pairs of eyes, it's got a pair of compound eyes here, and other eye spots underneath. Um, by the way, if you ever uh, pick up a horseshoe crab, it can't hurt you, it can't bite you or sting you or poke you or anything. Hold it like this, never hold it by the tail because the tail is attached to some internal organs. It'll probably fold up on itself as it tries to escape. Uh, you can tell the male from the female. The female, these upper claws here look like little pinchers, whereas the male, they look like little boxing gloves. Uh, and um, the numbers in Massachusetts, I understand, have been slightly increasing in the last few years. Uh, same uh, with uh, Connecticut. They're still declining in other parts of the country. Um, their eggs are a major food source for migratory birds like the red knot, uh, but uh, they're fascinating animals. And so um, if you see one, um, appreciate it because um, who knows, uh, you might know somebody whose life was saved by this particular animal. Uh, so they're really important. And then of course, I'm going to end my presentation by um, showing you a seaweed, uh, <laughs> which I always do. Um, can you see this? This is a press a specimen. This one is sea lettuce. It's just a pressed specimen of it. It's a bright green, looks just like lettuce. And I show it to you because sea lettuce has got a good side and a not so good side. The good side is it's nutritious. It's more nutritious for you than your garden salad. But I don't want you to run down to the beach and pull some up and throw it on your salad this evening. Uh, and that's because uh, sea lettuce also grows abundantly in areas with this high nitrogen concentration. So it's also an environmental indicator. Uh, there are some bays around here, Shoestring Bay in particular in Mashpee, where in springtime, you start to see a lot of it on the surface. Uh, it's very, very sensitive to any increase in nitrogen, which could be coming from many sources. Uh, so it's, um, it's something to keep in, in mind. But it is used in miso soups. It's used in all kinds of uh, seaweed salads. It's usually grown in the clean water environment, so it's safe to eat, uh, but you do have to be careful. And also might be a little crunchy. Uh, because um, there might be some animals living on it too as well. And you know, seaweeds are in the news a lot right now because they also uh, take up a carbon at a much faster rate than many of our terrestrial plants and trees. Uh, and so there's all kinds of interesting research going on to, to create seaweed farms and then uh, sink that seaweed into the sediments where it can trap that carbon for a long period of time. They've also possibly been used as a source of biofuels, uh, and they are in many, many different food additives. If you like to eat ice cream, you're eating seaweed. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, that's how I like to end my presentation, uh, except for any questions or answers. And um, I'm going to, let's see, I see chat here. Can I read it? Oh, I can. Um, so let me go through the chat questions. And... I'll just, just read them through, people identifying where they're coming from. Oh, wow, from all over. <laughs> Do you want me to read them out to you, Gil? Uh, yeah, if you have a question, that'd be great. Perfect. So Gordon asked, why have recent blue mussel sets not survived? Repeat that question again, please. Sure. Why have recent blue mussel sets not survived? Blue mussel. Okay, now this, I'm gonna, this is going to be a complicated answer. Uh, I'm going to start by saying 
many years ago, um, there used to be enormous numbers of blue mussels in the marsh system over by Town Neck and Sandwich. And I got a phone call one day from a friend of the Greenbrier Nature Center saying, have you been out there lately? All the blue mussels are gone. So I actually had my students set up a study which, we, which lasted with several classes for 10 years, looking at to why the blue mussels had disappeared. Uh, and we concluded that there were many factors affecting them. The biggest factor there was a physical factor. That whole area was eroding away. Mill Creek had grown twice as wide over the years. Uh, there were breakthroughs. Um, there was a combination of things. The jetty at the canal was actually causing erosion at Town Neck and removing the sand and depositing it down at Sandy Neck. And the mussels couldn't get a foothold. So we believe that they were disappearing because of that. But there are other factors which affect them too. Uh, when I checked with some people in Woods Hole, um, they are favorite food source are eider ducks. Okay, now I saw ducks there, but I didn't see that many. Um, there are viruses which also impact these animals, they don't just impact people, but they get viruses too. And apparently there was one that uh, not only impacted blue mussels, but impacted oysters and, and uh, other animals like cohogs. So it really depends on where the area is, but I would look to see if the area has been physically changing over time because the mussels need a substrate in order to survive and the banks were just collapsing and they, they couldn't survive. There are some that got reestablished because they were able to get some of these little quieter areas where there wasn't much erosion going on. Uh, but um, that's what I would do. If you're familiar with the area where they disappeared, I suspect that that's the reason. Okay, next question. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Janet asked, is there one thing that people can do individually to protect the salt marsh? Just one thing, Janet? Gee, there's so many things we can do. Uh, besides joining the Barnstable Land Trust, uh, which is probably the number one thing, uh, because now collectively you can preserve these areas around marshes. Marshes are protected under the Wetlands Protection Act, but their losses and their impact is through incremental losses and what's happening on land. So I would say the best thing to protect marshes is the same thing you do to protect water quality, to protect the environment in general. Be careful what you use in your homes. Be careful what you flush down the sinks and toilets and so forth because that groundwater is getting into the marshes. Um, be careful how much plastic you're using and whether or not you're disposing of it properly. Uh, and, you know, I think just general, all these things that we've all heard about conserving energy because nitrogen loading is also coming from the atmosphere. Um, not using fertilizers on your lawns. Uh, because, um, you know, that is also leaching into the water. So, you know, if I'd pick one thing, it would be collectively all of these things together. They're all going to benefit a salt marsh system. Uh, and, um, you know, conservation commissions will govern what kinds of development uh, within 100 feet of a marsh. And the state of Massachusetts is pretty strict about protecting marshes, mainly because of their, so their important function. I, I tell my students when you see the word salt marshes, those S's should be dollar signs because they do so much for us. So picking the one thing, Janet, would have been difficult, but um, uh, I, I think collectively all these things that we want to do to help protect the environment and our own personal decisions every day will benefit salt marshes. Really nice. Um, the next question is from Gordon. He says, has climate change and sea level rise affected salt, salt marshes, including the organisms? Yes, they have. And there's now data to suggest that salt marshes are, if they can, a migrating inland. I say if they can, if there's development there and there's no, no opportunity for that to change, they can't. Uh, or they're getting flooded. Uh, there's been some research done at the National Seashore, which has actually shown that there's been some serious uh, changes in the uh, landscaping in Chatham, by the way. I don't know if you've been out to Morris Island, and that whole salt marsh system there has been flooded. They've removed the walkway. They're removing the weather station. There's just a lot of erosion. And part of that, Gordon, is due to sea level rise. Uh, and this is something that we all have to be concerned about because this is where we live. Uh, and uh, so I think uh, 
The answer is yes, and there is some hard data to back that up. Wonderful. Um, the next question is from Susan. She asked, is it related to trilobites? And I'm not sure what she was referring to. Horseshoe crabs. Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Probably. <laughs> yes, uh, sort of. The, the horseshoe crab is actually its own class, but there is, they are somewhat related. More related to the scorpions and spiders and the arachnid group, but the horseshoe crabs are in their own class altogether. And there are actually other species of horseshoe crabs on Earth. It's not, here we have Limulus polyphemus. It's not the, the only one around. It's the only one we have, uh, but uh, yes. Perfect. Sue asked, years ago, we did a guided walk in the area and saw the most lady slippers we've ever seen. Are they still thriving in this area? They were last year, and I'm hoping they will be again this year. So I would say mid to late May and early June, take another walk out there. I think I've got a couple scheduled. Lily's got me scheduled for a couple. Uh, and uh, yeah, there are pockets of lady slippers. I don't know if you know about lady slipper. It's an orchid. Uh, we don't have a lot of orchids around here, even though it's the largest uh, flowering group on planet Earth. Uh, and um, they grow in some, they have very unique conditions that they grow in, uh, usually in a pine woodland, a somewhat open area. Um, they have a uh, soil mycorrhizal relationship with a fungus. Uh, so that's why you can't transplant them. Uh, and uh, yeah, they're out there. Uh, the pink lady slipper, Cypripedia macaulay is the scientific name. So yeah, go back out again. I think you'll see them again this year. That's all the questions we have right now. Okay, I can open it up if anybody has any questions, but um, I see a comment here. Blue mussels are back and sandwiched at the Boardwalk Beach. Okay, that's good. I knew there were some pockets that they had come back, they, but they're not along the banks, I don't think, because that's just changed so much. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, they, they will come back. That's the thing. If you can get a, a nice habitat and, uh, for these areas, then they can be restored. Gil, 